Well, hi, everyone. A couple of interesting developments with the Francis Scott Key Bridge Replacement Project, as well as the investigation being conducted by the NTSB. I'm recording this video on Thursday, November 20th, 2025. On Tuesday, November 18th, the National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, came out with a press release indicating a very specific cause for the power failure of the dolly, which caused it to lose control and crash into a pier on the Francis Scott Keat Bridge and causing its collapse 2024. So I'm gonna go over the details of that announcement, but more importantly, I wanna go over what the implications are for other bridges across the US, across the world, and what I think has to be done from a design or retrofit standpoint to provide better protection for these bridges against catastrophic collapse. So the NTSB announcement indicated that a single loose wire on the 984 foot long container ship dolly caused the electrical blackout, which made the vessel veer off course and impact the Francis Scott Key Bridge Pier. Interestingly, the timing of this announcement coincided with another announcement, design and bridge replacement costs would exceed $5.2 billion, and the timeline would be extended for the completion of the bridge another two years into late 2030. Apparently, the lower initial cost estimates of $1.7 billion came at less than a 20% design level, so I don't even know why they bothered uh, throwing a number or schedule around if they're going to be that far off. Keywood is doing the work for this project. So let's get back to the power failure. The dolly has these control panels for the power system, and they have these terminal blocks where these wires plug into these various connections. And what NTSB identified was that there are these ferrules that go into the terminal block, and because of a label on these cables, on these wires that were improperly placed that the cable couldn't make a full connection with the terminal block. And this is what a cross section of this terminal block looks like. You can see this is what it should be, the ferrule contacting well inside the, the face of the terminal block. But because of this label, the ferrule couldn't go very far into the terminal block, which caused an intermittent connection, which tripped a breaker and caused the power failure. And this video sped up eight times, but you could see the power went out, and they tried desperately to get the power back on. It comes on briefly as it heads closer and closer to the pier. But by this time, they've gone so far off course, it's too late to recover. Power goes out again. Ship gets closer and closer to the bridge pier. And eventually makes contact with the pier. And because of this design, this continuous truss, it collapsed in a cascading fashion. And we know the Federal Ship Channel was blocked for several weeks. They had to clear the dolly out of there. They had to clear the remnants of the main span of the bridge. Now Maryland Transportation Authority is in the process of removing the approach spans. That's a rather lengthy process. And now they're underway with the test pile program. But earlier this year, on March 18th, 2025, MTSB comes out with this information that owners of bridges should do more to safeguard their projects, their bridges from vessel strikes. There was a statement in this release that I thought was rather inaccurate. As part of the investigation, the NTSB in March released an initial report on the vulnerability of bridges nationwide to large vessel strikes. The report found that the Maryland Department of Transportation Authority and many other owners of bridges spanning navigable waterways used by ocean-going vessels were likely unaware of the potential risk that a vessel collision could pose to their structures. That's nonsense. There's been many episodes of ship impacts causing portions of bridges to collapse, many cases involving a number of deaths going back decades. So this shouldn't have been a surprise. I don't know why NTSB is, is trying to cover for these bridge owners. Now, clear back in the 90s, in response to previous bridge impacts that caused portions of bridges to collapse with resultant deaths, the uh, AASHTO, its organization of state highway transportation officials, came out with vessel collision design for highway bridges. And they updated this guidance in 2009. But because they're aware of funding issues, they exempted themselves from applying these design standards to existing projects. This was 
strictly for new bridge projects. And I've been critical about that methodology in previous videos because whether you apply it to new or existing bridges, they take a probabilistic approach, which, and I'll go over the details, just is not rational in my opinion. It appears rational, but it's based on a lot of assumptions for input parameters and assumptions that aren't based on much data in many cases. So going back to the Francis Scott Key Bridge, we have these very small dolphins and they were hundreds of feet away from the bridge piers and wholly ineffective. In fact, the uh, dolly didn't even impact any of these dolphins, according to reports. But getting back to this design methodology, you have to go through an assessment on the characteristics of the vessel traffic. You know, how big are the ships? What are the transit speeds? Vessel loading characteristics, geometry of the channel, the water depths, and so on. And then you have to figure out the frequency distribution of these various parameters and you plug it into a formula and you come out with a risk assessment. How would you, for example, predict the size of a ship 30 years from now? You know, we saw a huge change in the size of ships when the Francis Scott Key Bridge was first opened to uh, traffic in 1977 versus when the Dolly took out the Key Bridge in 2024. It was a huge increase in size of ships. Clearly that hadn't been anticipated. But for decades, it was obvious that there was inadequate peer protection for the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Now, I've talked about this book in previous videos, Anti-Fragile. And I think anyone involved with bridge infrastructure projects should read this book. And the idea is anti-fragile is something that gets better under stress. I don't think that's a reasonable expectation for a bridge. At the very least, we don't want them to be fragile, as we found with the Key Bridge. We want to have a resilient bridge, and that's what I'm gonna cover here today. But instead of coming up with a bunch of assumptions on what the ship size may be in the future, or how fast it's traveling, or the probability that a ship is gonna have a power failure or go off course, I think a more rational approach would be to use a general risk matrix, where you look at the likelihood of an event occurring and you look at its consequence, whether it's insignificant or extreme, whether the occurrence is rare or almost certain, I think that's far more effective and frankly what I would call a common sense approach rather than assuming a bunch of things so that you can make a calculation that appears to be accurate and use that to base decisions on how you should either design a project or retrofit a bridge project to protect from vessel impacts. Now, if you look at this press release from NTSB, where seemingly a single loose cable caused a ship to hit a bridge, the bridge to collapse, killed six people, and has done billions of dollars in damages. You would think that would be a, a butterfly effect, but there's an interesting article, and I have a link to this article in the description, talking about how we really misunderstand the butterfly effect. And the definition of the butterfly effect is the idea that small, seemingly trivial events may ultimately result in something with much larger consequences. In other words, they have nonlinear impacts on very complex systems. For instance, when a butterfly flaps its wings in India, that tiny change in air pressure could eventually cause a tornado in Iowa. And the term was coined back in the early 1960s by Edward Lorenz, who is a meteorology professor at MIT, and he was studying weather patterns, and he devised a model demonstrating that if you compare two starting points indicating current weather that are near each other, they'll soon drift apart. And later, one area could wind up with severe storms while the other being calm. In other words, in real life examples, it's very hard to predict, or virtually impossible, the outcome the ultimate outcome for an event based on really minor variations in the initial condition of the system. And he was doing this study because at the time, people thought that you could definitely predict future weather based on historical records. And just another example of this is this tragedy that killed 109 people on a Concorde flight July 25th, 2000, where a Concorde jet exploded on takeoff. And the cause of that 
failure was determined to be some metal debris from a prior pl uh, plane taking off on the runway caused a blowout of one of the tires on the Concorde and a flat tire quickly developed a lot of friction as the plane was in the process of taking off, caught on fire, chunks of burning rubber hit the underside of the wing, which caused the fuel tank to explode. So if you just take the initial input conditions of saying whether or not a piece of metal on the runway would cause a catastrophic failure of an aircraft, I think that'd be very difficult to predict. In general, people understand that you shouldn't have debris on runways, but if somebody tried to get into the weeds of saying whether that particular piece of debris would cause a problem or its specific location on the runway would cause a problem, it's, it's impossible to predict. And that's the point of the butterfly effect. And really this concept's been around for hundreds of years. There's this old proverb and it's taken on various forms throughout the years. This one's from 1758 from Ben Franklin. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. And for want of a horse, the rider was lost, being overtaken and slain by the enemy, all for the want of care about a horseshoe nail. So that's not a cascading failure. That's a nonlinear response to a small change in initial input conditions. So again, the butterfly effect. And a cascading failure is a series of predictable events that cause a failure in a system. And this is out of wiki here, but a cascading failure is a failure in a system of interconnected parts in which the failure of one or few parts leads to the failure of other parts growing progressively as a result of positive feedback. And I would add that it progresses in a predictable fashion. There was a impact with a ship in 1980 with the Key Bridge, three years after it opened, this Blue Nagoya ship. It was 390 feet long. Compare that to the dolly, which was nearly 1,000 feet long 44 years later. And now that the officials are in the position of having to replace this bridge, they're making some obvious changes. They have a greater clearance of the span over the waterway. And more importantly, it's a wider span between the piers in the main channel, 1,600 feet versus 1,200 feet with the previous version of the key bridge. And this is important. They've placed the piers so far apart with the new design that a ship would actually have to run aground before it would hit one of the piers. NTSB has identified dozens of bridges throughout the United States that may be vulnerable for this type of ship impact. And I think it's good to look at it again from a more uh, broad standpoint in terms of risk. Again, a common sense approach. Unfortunately, people are taking this list, and I actually know a consultant who is going through these various tedious calculations, uh, a probabilistic approach to the risk associated with each of these bridges, which again, I think is an utterly nonsensical methodology. I think it has value to identify the risk factors, but to assign a probability to it, like you know, assigning the probability that a nail would cause a kingdom to fall is, is silly. But here's some design pictures for the new bridge. You can see these massive fender systems around the main bridge piers. You can see there's a cable stage structure, which is a more robust design relative to what they had before with a continuous truss bridge. With a continuous truss bridge, you have a failure of a key member that could cause the collapse of the whole span, which is what happened with the key bridge. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on this design methodology, how to protect existing bridges. It just seems like it takes many, many tragedies, many catastrophes before real change is applied to our system for how we design and operate infrastructure projects and in particular bridges. Again, there's been many examples as I've covered in past videos of ships hitting bridges, knocking out spans, causing several deaths in the process and people are slow or have been slow to wake up to the risks and actually doing something about it. But I think this is a real opportunity again if people don't get too far into the weeds and try to overuse a probabilistic approach based on too many assumptions or insufficient data. I think a more holistic approach 
a system-wide approach needs to be taken. So with that, I want to send a shout out to those of you who've contributed to buy me a coffee. That's one of the better ways to support this channel. If you're so inclined, there's a link in the description. I also want to thank the channel members and certainly thank those of you who've contributed to Super Thanks, additional great ways to support the channel. I'll continue to follow this story and provide updates as the design build project progresses. So stay tuned, everyone.